Jonathan and uh, greetings from the Food and Agriculture Pavilion, which is co-hosted by the FAO together with CGIR and the Rockefeller Foundation. Uh, my name is Inkar Kaderjanova. I am the Senior Climate Change Officer at the Office of Climate, Environment and Biodiversity at the headquarters in the FAO. And I will be your moderator today for this event. The title of our event is Sustainable and Circular Bioeconomy in the Climate Agenda, Opportunities to Transform Agri-Food Systems. I would like to start by explaining how we're going to spend this hour. Um, we will first start with a short video prepared by colleagues in the FAO that will set the frame for our conversation. Then we'll have a keynote speaker. Then we'll proceed uh, to the panel discussion where we'll have five speakers, five distinguished experts. Um, four of them will join us online and one expert is here in the room. And then uh, at the end of the event, we'll uh, wrap up, summarize the key points and, and conclude our uh, meeting. So uh, before before I introduce the, the topic of the event, I would like to ask the technicians to play the video, please. Today is the last day of COP27, and a lot has been said about the interlinkages between agriculture and climate change. Agriculture is one of the uh, most significant sectors to the impacts of climate change. It is also the sector that contributes a third to the global emission totals, but this is at the same time is the sector that offers a lot of solutions. We cannot achieve the one and a half temperature goal set under the Paris Agreement without the uh, solutions coming from the sector. And in order to mobilize all and everybody involved in the agri-food systems, we have to continue tirelessly working on generating the knowledge, understanding the opportunities, testing and practicing, and finding the best possible solutions to bring the emission trajectory down in order to comply with the Paris Agreement targets and goals. COP27 has seen a greater focus on agricultural system transformation than any previous COP before. This is a very decisive moment in the climate negotiations when the negotiators we are, are working able on to finalizing hear the, the negotiation presenter text right on now. the enhanced implementation of the Karanivia Joint Work on Agriculture. We all are looking forward to the outcome of the negotiation round at this COP and hoping that a very ambitious and clear uh, text that will, will be agreed at the end of the day. Sustainable and circular bioeconomy has the potential to be the game changer in food and agriculture. It can address all major planetary crises, biodiversity loss, ecosystem deg degradation, and of course, climate change. Bioeconomy contributes simultaneously to many objectives and can generate so many uh, core benefits. Uh, by replacing fossil-based resources and processes with biological ones and removing toxin and waste from agricultural value chains, making them more resilient. This is the overarching message that um, 
is uh, of, of the FAO, of the new FAO publication, which I am happy to launch today, the sustainable and biocircular economy in the climate agenda: opportunities to transform agri-food systems. You can find this publication in the in event invitation, and also on the website of the FAO. The new publication highlights bioeconomy opportunities to improve adaptation and resilience in the areas of food security, nutrition, livelihoods, and ecosystem management. At the moment, more than 60 countries and regions have bioeconomy or bioscience-related solutions uh, in their national policy strategies. And many of the bioeconomy uh, practices have been included in the initial and updated NDCs. And in order to unpack the findings of the new publications and discuss the incredible opportunities that this, um, uh, the, that the bioeconomy offers for climate action, it is my great privilege to present a number of distinguished speakers today. Our speakers represent regional and international organizations, private sector, academia, and the climate finance sector as well. So without any further ado, I would like to invite our keynote speaker, Dr. Joachim von Braun. Hello, good morning. Hello, can you hear me? Brown. Yes, we can hear you very well. Dr. Von Braun. I can hear you. Excellent. Dr. Von Braun. I see in the chat that uh, they are working on it. Uh, they will connect us back, the people in the IT. Uh, group Thank you, Tassila, in the venue are uh, trying okay. to get us reconnected. Yeah. 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 Tassilis, thank you so much. Uh, at the moment, uh, yeah, can you please mute yourself okay. for the moment? We'll um, let me proceed if it's time. okay. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, let me introduce you, Dr. Uh, Von Brown. Please, Tassila, let them, let them speak. Are, are you the moderator? No, um, I am not. I am also a speaker later. So we need to wait for the moderator who is now speaking in the room to call upon us to speak. Uh, yes, uh, Dr. Von Brown, I would like to introduce you now and um, pass the floor to you. So Dr. Von Brown is a distinguished professor for economic and technological change at Bonn University Hello? Center for Development Research. Dr. von Braun's research is, in is on economic development, science and technology policy, poverty reduction, food and nutrition security, agriculture, resource economics and trade. And in his address today, he will uh, discuss the current bioeconomy challenges and opportunities. Dr. von Braun, the floor is yours. Dr. von Braun, can you hear us? I think we're having a technical problem at the moment. Um, do you hear me? We can hear you very well. Yes. Can you hear us? Professor von Braun, please. Okay. Then I proceed. Yes, please. Go ahead. Thank you so much. Well, good morning, colleagues. I'm very happy that um, the organizers and um, FAO are putting bioeconomy high on the agenda of uh, climate deliberations. A sustainable bioeconomy protects and makes use of nature while at the same time supporting global food security, climate protection, and the regeneration of natural resources, in particular fertile soils, clean air, and clean water. Bioeconomy is critical to limit warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. The food systems, as you know, contributes about 30% of greenhouse gas emissions and the construction sectors, so the building sector, the infrastructure, about 40%. These two sectors can become more climate sensitive through transformation towards bioeconomy 
and will then also be more resilient. This includes aspects of energy efficiency, sustainable lifestyles, circularity and waste prevention, um, determining a sustainable bioeconomy. Bioeconomy is fundamental for transformative actions serving resilience, resilience of people and communities and nations. With respect to climate action, resilience entails three aspects. The mitigation, bending the warming curve down, as you know, adaptation, reductions in risk reduction, enhancement of adaptive capacity, especially for the vulnerable 4 billion people in the world, and transformation entailing change of lifestyles, integrate action uh, on climate, biodiversity, and inequality. What can we expect in the future? The future bioeconomy dynamics are driven by three drivers. The price environment, the energy price, the bio-based materials price expectations, and the improved quality of products um, and um, related prices. So the economics, that's why we talk about bioeconomy. Secondly, by biosciences, the technology innovations, especially in life science, digitization, including nature-based solutions, which are also science intensive. And third, by the climate crisis, the unsustainability in the Anthropocene, the risks, the risks and uncertainties force um, the world into a bioeconomy. So bioeconomy is not something which uh, uh, is uh, simply um, pushed by a few interest groups or so. It is happening because of the need, the demand and the opportunity. Policy response is happening. Bioeconomy strategies have been formulated at national and international level in more than 60 countries and regions in Africa, in particular in East Africa. Um, our colleague uh, uh, Julius Ikuru will speak later. In Europe, in Latin America and the Caribbean, in China recently, uh, a new strategy. In the ASEAN region, in the United States. So strategies uh, of meaningful bioeconomies in great diversity are coming along and it is great that FAO and the United Nations systems will provide strategic guidance at a global level for bioeconomy. Secondly, the response is happening with knowledge and skill advancement. Third, what must happen is that climate finance comes along for bioeconomy transformation. We look to COP27 to mobilize climate finance for bioeconomy transformation. And last not least, the R&D programs for bioeconomy, for food, for biorefineries, uh, for uh, uh, a soft biochemical sector, uh, the um, nutrition and sustainability of, um, of food production aspects but also transforming the traditional uh, environmentally wasteful uh, cooking systems um, in many low-income households of the world with charcoal and wood. So in some bioeconomy is central for overcoming the climate crisis. We must mobilize the resources for it and accelerate climate action in and for the food systems, the agri-food systems. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor von Braun. It was really interesting to hear from you, and, and the range of challenges and the opportunities is really remarkable. It is really interesting that you uh, put so many perspectives on the table, the economic angle, the technology and digitalization angle, the importance of the knowledge generation, the climate finance, the R&D, and also the solutions at the household level. Thank you so much. This is a great framing for our conversation. So, um, I would like to now uh, give the floor to our next speaker, who is Dr. Adrian Lip.
Dr. Adrian Leap is the head of bioeconomy sector in the Bioeconomy and Food Systems Unit at the European Commission's Directorate General Research and Innovation. He is also a lead author of the six IPCC assessment report working group three, where he was responsible for preparation of the section on food systems. Dr. Leap, I'm just checking if he is online. Hello, yes, hello, good morning, here you are. Good morning. Dr. Lip, uh, my question to you is, how can biodiversity sectors, especially in the agri-food systems, help us reach the goals of the Paris Agreement? And what specifically does the European Commission, uh, how specifically the European Commission support the bioeconomy policies that advance the climate agenda? I also would like to share with the participants that Dr. Adrian uh, was one of the uh, uh, peer reviewers uh, who contrib contributed to the preparation of the uh, FIOS publication that we are launching today. Thank you. Dr. Lip, the floor is yours. Yes, th thank you very much. And let me first thank you for inviting me. It's a great honor but also congratulate you for having set up this discussion. At the European Commission, we are also convinced that the sustainable and circular bioeconomy is indeed essential if we want to achieve our climate targets. Let me start with a few numbers from the IPCC report. Joachim von Braun already said that food systems contribute with one third to global anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions, 17 gigatons of CO2 equivalents from production to consumption of food and waste management, this is about the total emissions of the US and China together. Since 1990, the share has decreased from 40% to 31%, but absolute emissions have increased in all sectors except LULUCF. At the same time, the share of emissions from energy use has increased from 18% to 23%. Now, when assessing mitigation options in food systems, it's important to take a holistic and systemic approach. Food systems, as all bioeconomy systems, are complex, many different actors which lot, with lots of feedback loops and each with different power to drive the necessary change. But while the biggest contribution to emissions still comes from the farms, farmers are usually not those with the power. And also consumers are too often constrained by an unfriendly food environment. Many people can just not afford or access healthy diets Certainly so in the global south, but not only. Mitigation opportunities, there are plenty of them in the bioeconomy. I will just mention the most impactful one, which is the shift towards a diet that is more plant-based than currently. Of course, this applies not for those who are already vegetarian or have to consume very little meat. Very important in support of this dietary shift are emerging food technologies, such as precision fermentation, cultured meat, plant-based alternatives. The EU invests heavily in alternative proteins. It has a food 2030 pathway in the Horizon 2020 program. And here we are supporting 70 million euro, um, about 15 projects currently with a specific focus on alternative proteins, plus others with a focus, for example, on dietary shift. And in the upcoming Horizon Europe work program, 23-24, four additional projects will be funded worth about 40 million. Now, how can the food system transformation be realized? The IPCC report is very clear on this. Single policies won't work. There's the need for coherent and integrated policy packages. For example, a shift to nature positive production methods, which we need, need also go hand in hand with reduced animal consumption to compensate for additional land requirements. Integrated policy packages are not only more effective, but they are also more cost efficient. They can address multiple sustainability goals. They can avoid social hardships and increase acceptance. For the European Union, bioeconomy is exactly such an integrating policy framework to enhance policy coherence. What should be in such a package? Financial instruments, information, education are important to increase food and bioeconomy literacy, but also behavioral instruments, which are important to make good choices easier, compensate information deficits, and have been shown to have a high enabling effect on other policies. Very important, 
of course, are also continued investment in research and innovation. Our Horizon Europe research program has a full cluster related to bioeconomy with an overall budget of almost 9 billion. And at least 35% of the whole Horizon Europe budget is dedicated to climate action. As mentioned, bioeconomy policy is an enabling policy framework to design just and green transition pathways looking at the environmental, social and economic dimension of sustainability. We need to speed up the defossilization of our societies and bioeconomy contributes by substituting products with new and smarter ones that emit less greenhouse gases, but have also longer lifetimes and are more circular. By storage of carbon in the products, which gives benefit for the climate, even if the carbon will eventually be returned, and by enhancing the uptake of carbon in ecosystems with a full range of co-benefits. To make that happen, the EU has a bioeconomy strategy updated in 2018 with a detailed action plan to speed up the deployment of bioeconomy in Europe, to foster innovation, for example, with a large two billion partnership with the bio-based industry, and to work on the scientific basis, for example, to monitor bioeconomies and to understand the ecological limits. We are currently evaluating possible next steps. For example, we would like to give even more focus on balancing the demand for sustainable biomass with how much can be produced and look systematically at trade-offs and synergies. Another focus might be the consumption side to ensure that sustainable choices can be made easy by everyone. We are cooperating on these ideas across all scales, certainly intensively with our EU member states, but also internationally, for example, with the FAO or international forum. To mention here is the International Bioeconomy Forum, which the EU is currently co-chairing together with South Africa. Here, it focuses on research, innovation, cooperation, for example, on the usually important and under-researched topic of the microbiome. Lastly, bioeconomy is a vision. Imagine how you would like to live in maybe 20 years and make it happen through bioeconomy. Many thanks, and thank you also for your attention. Thank you so much. It was so interesting to hear from you uh, about this uh, enabling effect. This is a very important point. I think we have to remember that putting in place one right policy, the government can generate so many uh, positive synergies with the uh, additional policies that uh, relate to the environmental management and economic development. So the synergistic approach is potentially can bring a lot of additional co-benefits. It was also interesting to hear about the work that is being done within the European Union and also internationally. Thank you for, for sharing this and thank you for also sharing the good news about the long-term vision in the European Union on this particular topic. Now, now moving on, I would like to invite our next speaker. Let me introduce uh, Dr. Julius Ekuru, who is a project manager at the BioInnovate Africa. He is also a co-chair of the International Advisory Council on Global Bioeconomy. I'm just checking if he's online. Dr. Ekuru, good morning. Yes, you're online. Morning. We can Thank see you. you. Excellent. You. Thank you for Thank you so joining much. us. So I have a question to you, Dr. Kuru. Can you tell us about the latest bioeconomy innovations in Eastern Africa region, and in particular, which models make innovation collaboration between actors and regions easier and mutually beneficial? Please share with us your perspective. Yeah, th thank you so much. Uh, first of all, um, let me thank uh, the FAO uh, for putting my economy high on the climate agenda, especially in this COP 2027. And uh, I also like the video um, that you shared, uh, which clearly explained the role of bioeconomy uh, in our food systems. Um, and Joachim von Braun, uh, in his remarks, also expounded on this uh, very well. So we, we, uh, we have learned, first of all, that doing bioeconomy innovations for climate action is, is possible in our region of Eastern Africa uh, through collaborations uh, between scientists uh, in the universities and, 
and research institutes, or what we call academia, and, um, and the industry partners, as well as the government. Uh, but then it needs to be facilitated uh, for this to happen. Uh, it, just, it just doesn't happen uh, from our experience, and there must be uh, an actor to facilitate uh, this process of collaboration. And, and that's partly what we do uh, here in Bio Innovate Africa, uh, in Eastern Africa, where we enable the scientists to translate uh, innovative biologically-based ideas or inventions or research outputs uh, into practical uses in the communities they serve. So as, as you probably uh, all know, um, Eastern Africa, more than 65% of, of our people here live in the rural areas, and they depend on um, biological resources uh, for their food, fuel, medicine, and, and other uses. And of course, this is usually in the very, very raw form. And uh, production is suboptimal uh, in, many, in many ways. But even when we have good, you know, harvest, uh, we usually lose about 40% uh, in post-harvest losses. So we've learned that uh, uh, value addition, particularly through innovation, diversifies the sources of biological uh, or uses, uses of the biological resources, and also diversifies sources of growth, and creates uh, new business prospects, uh, both for the urban and also the rural communities. And what we've seen also is um, when we do this innovation, value addition, integrating with, uh, with digital solutions, then we are attracting more youth uh, into farming and agri-based agri uh, uh, enterprises. But let me just share a couple of examples um, where we are seeing, you know, partnerships work. Uh, we have, for instance, um, now uh, uh, succeeded in uh, in composting urban waste, for example, into biofertilizers with enhanced sources of plant nitrogen. We are able to take, you know, this uh, city city agro agro waste uh, and then enhanced nitrogen in that fertilizer up to 3%, uh, which, is, which is really good, uh, especially for farming, uh, uh, you know, crops like uh, avocado or flory, floriculture um, and other vegetables. And then we have also through uh, partnerships with uh, you know, scientists and industry, uh, been able to successfully now deploy the black soldier fly um, a larvae, especially as an alternative source of protein, uh, mostly uh, for, 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 for poultry, uh, that is chicken, and, and also for fish, you know, for fish farming. Because the, the other sources like soy, fish, are quite expensive, and, and this uh, black soldier fly larvae is now are becoming more economical, especially for, for our farmers, both in the urban and, and rural settings. But even more, we are finding that the frass fertilizer, that is the compost, uh, 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 the manure that is you know, composted by the, by the flies, has even greater advantages uh, in, for instance, balancing the soil pH, um, and also is very rich in uh, soil micronutrients. And we've done some studies which have shown that um, if farmers actually use this plus fertilizer, they enhance their incomes by up to 40%. So, so we are now looking at, you know, we now say here that uh, the bio waste has become a potential for bio wealth, uh, which, which is really a turning point in the way we think about uh, waste uh, in our communities. And we are looking now to also co-locating uh, biorefineries, you know, near places where waste is, is, is generated. Maybe, um, uh, I don't know whether I still have time, but just a couple of things I should mention is um, we do now also recycle wastewater from agro-industries. 
uh, through an integrated system for you know, using aerobic and anaerobic digestion and combining this with constructed wetlands. So we find that uh, through this process, we can have a circular flow of water and uh, we can even you know, uh, embed like uh, aquaculture or fish farming uh, to this so that you know, we are no longer uh, discharging uh, effluents, uh, toxic effluents in, in our water streams and waterways. So these solutions that I have spoken about are already being deployed as some kind of small scale enterprises and, and businesses and creating opportunities for, for jobs and, and incomes. Now, um, maybe I should stop there and uh, ask if you have uh, further questions and I may continue. Thank you so thank you so much, Julius, uh, for sharing with us your perspective. It is absolutely important to support the collaboration among the researchers and also feed this information to the policy makers. So this science policy interface where you are operating is absolutely important because we do need a lot of additional knowledge, research, and uh, and also the information about exactly this type of small scale successful pilot projects that. Can can demonstrate that we can achieve through one project level intervention so many wins and create this triple or quadruple win situation by solving the climate change problems, improving the adaptation and resilience, improving the urban waste management and, and uh, water, wastewater treatment, soil quality issues. Thank you so much for sharing this perspective uh, from Africa with us. Now, I would like to invite our next speaker. It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Tassila Banda, who is a Zambian uh, conservation scientist, sustainable land management and ecosystem restoration specialist, and also a founding member of the Network of African Women in Environment. Tassila, I, I see you are here with us. Uh, good morning. So my question to you is, can you please share with us how bioeconomy policy can help the type of work you do in agroforestry with smallholder farmers and also with women entrepreneurs? Um, thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me to be part of this uh, discussion this morning. I am really honored to be here. and. Bioeconomy uh, is one of the areas where I am actively involved or have been actively involved in the past few years. And I was very delighted when I first got to be introduced to, to this work that FAO is doing through another program that uh, uh, I am supported through FAO as a woman negotiator, the FMM 149 as one of the key topics, especially for this COP that we are present at now. So it's great work and um, I will indeed bring a perspective from the ground of the type of things that governments, uh, communities are doing in Zambia. Um, I bring uh, experience from the Eastern province of Zambia where an integrated forest landscape project uh, is currently being implemented. So I know that uh, someone has already shared the importance of policies. The government of Zambia has recently created a green economy and environment ministry whose mandate is to ensure biosafety, to develop a carbon credit policy, to develop and improve on the climate change policy, environmental policy, environmental pollution control, research and training, forestry policy and uh, green economy and industry policy. So we are very excited in Zambia about this ministry and um, it's good that there are few policies in place that we have been able to utilize uh, in the rural areas at the ground level with women and with youth, particularly in this example that I'm, I'm sharing uh, where the focus of green economy has been around biodiversity conservation. Um, it's been around sustainable forest management. Another component has been on climate smart agriculture. 
as well as ensuring long-term sustainability by having inclusive climate finance so that when we train communities on biodiversity conservation, when we train communities on forest management, when we train them on how to carry out climate smart agriculture, once the project, which uh, I need to mention, is a World Bank financed project at 32.8 million US dollar worth, once the project phased out through this climate finance to the sub communities, they should be able to continue the things that they have been trained after these various institutions have also been supported to strengthen them on how to take care of the national reserves, whether it's forest or wildlife, and also the agriculture extension system has been strengthened, then the communities can continue to practice the things that the project has set in place. I should also mention that this project is an emissions reduction project. So everything that is happening from every angle of these bioeconomic activities is also going to contribute not just to the adaptation, but also the mitigation uh, process. So it's a whole complete uh, uh, system, uh, starting from land use planning, participatory land use planning for the communities, the women and the youth to know where they want to do agriculture, where they want to do forest management, where they want to have settlements. And then it feeds into the district level. By the way, this whole landscape is about the size of the Netherlands. So when the whole area has been planned, it means that the communities know what climate actions need to happen. And those are the climate actions according to their own needs on their ground, on the ground that they are sending for applications for that climate finance. In some instances, the enterprises that we've seen come uh, have come out of this participatory process. Good examples are those that relate to the formation of community forest management areas. Um, there's a whole process that uh, communities that choose to participate in this are going through and they are able to reach seven steps. When they do that, they kind of graduate. And when they graduate, it means that the director of forestry is now giving them the user rights for that particular area that they have designated to have as a community forest management group. What is happening there in most cases of the applicants, uh, communities, is that they want to participate in enterprises such as beekeeping. And when you put uh, bees or beehives in a community area, you immediately notice that there is less cutting of trees because no one wants to agitate the bees. So beekeeping has become a flagship for conservation of these community forest areas, some of which might have reached a degraded level, but because of that protection, you find that the, the forest areas are na naturally regenerating. So the forests are coming back, and when the forests are coming back, it means that we, what we have lost in terms of wild fruits, what we have lost in terms of wild mushrooms, these also begin to come up again. And that also creates another chain of enterprise, like um, wild mushroom uh, drying and selling, uh, wild fruit drying and selling. So those are the additional benefits that are coming out of these areas. Other enterprises that have reached out and have applied uh, in um, aquaculture or goat rearing, um, most popular in this landscape have been um, value addition in the agriculture sector. And this one, I want to explain a little bit the model that we have utilized there. We, if you take the size of the entire landscape, which I shared, we have in each of that province uh, about 14 districts. Under this district, um, the district in terms of the existing structure of the Ministry of Agriculture is that they, they are divided into blocks and each block is then divided into camps to make sure that they are at the smallest management unit. In those uh, uh, camps, we started out by developing a climate smart agriculture manual, which then was deployed to train all the camp extension officers. 
when the camp extension officers were trained, they were able to set up a lead farmer, uh, a, a farmer field school. I think FAO is one of the partners that is also well known about farmer field schools. A farmer field school comprises of about 45 lead farmers. And each of these lead farmers is then encouraged to recruit about 10 follower farmers. They, we have seen very ambitious lead farmers that have up to 25 follower farmers. And we have also seen very ambitious follower farmers who have actually done very successful uh, activities on their land better than the lead farmer. So it's a combination of how individual farmer households take these trainings and what we saw, we, we selected three crops, maize, sunflower, and soya beans, which are cash crops in our country, because the main aim of this activity is also to improve livelihoods of the rural communities. So maize, for example, in the very first year, which is first harvest year planting in 2018 to 2019, we saw that there was a tripling of yield. So an average, um, for example, for maize, an average yield in the province is about 1.84 tons. <laughs> what we saw with these, uh, with these uh, farmer field schools was that they were able to achieve six tons per, per hectare. And then um, when the lead farmers now took these lessons and took them to their own farm to teach their follower farmers, because they are available at their land more times than at the farmer field schools, they have been able to achieve seven tons. What 1.84 tons of maize looks like is about 26 to 28 bags of maize. And we know from statistics that a household of six people will feed on about 30 bags of maize per year. What seven tons of maize looks like is about 120 plus bags. So that means that this household that achieves uh, seven tons is, per hectare is able to sell everything beyond 31 bags and 120 for immediate income. Dr. Banda, the yeah. Th thank you so much for, for sharing this level of details with us. But if you can summarize in one minute, because we still have two more speakers. Oh. Sorry, I get very excited when I'm speaking about uh, what we are doing on the ground. Yes, so basically, um, I've shared the four areas of bioeconomy, and I think what you asked me about was about the barriers. I think there are only two areas of barriers that I would like to, 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 to share with you for these smallholder farmers that have come up with these enterprises. Number one is the policy barrier. When we first saw the good results of climate smart agriculture, what we wanted was uh, a, that we developed, actually developed a CAB memo, which would mandate all the subsidy recipients to practice climate smart agriculture. Because in there, we saw the food security, we saw the, the, the livelihood improvement, we saw the contribution to adaptation commitments, the mitigation, as well as just general improvement of the economy of our country. The second gap is financial gap. Mm. During the COVID, we realized that we can do everything with the training of these farmers and, and the entrepreneurs, but we need to be sure that they have a way of getting their soil fertility mapping and analysis and diagnostics done. The other one is the blends of fertilizer. I'm glad to hear the East Africa example. These are some of the things and concept notes that we developed to make sure that we have some localized blended fertilization of these uh, new, uh, soils. The third one is in crop Th processing. Yes, thank you so much for sharing so much with us. It was really fascinating to hear from you the practical results of the community level work. I really admired the work that you are doing in the social mobilization and women's empowerment and the livelihood creation. I think it is truly, truly uh, innovative and, and, and much needed. And this type of work should be scaled up not only in the country, but in the uh, region and also uh, in the rest of the world. But I would like to move on because we don't have that much time left and our next speaker is John Connerop who is the senior vice president for sustainability transformation at Stora Enzo he is a leading 
which is a leading provider of renewable products in packaging, biomaterials, wooden construction and paper, and one of the largest private forest owners in the world. Uh, and John is here with us. Um, uh, I would like to ask you a question. So your company is leading the way globally in using renewable bio-based materials in a variety of sectors, including agriculture. What role governments should play to support the acceleration and upscale of sustainable circular uh, solutions? So it would be he interesting to hear from a private sector person the views on the role of the public sector policies, but if you also want to add on the importance of the private sector action as well, that would be really valuable. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Is the microphone on? Thank you very much and thank you for inviting me and, and I would like to thank FAO uh, for putting this topic on the agenda. Um, I think we've seen a little bit more bioeconomy in this COP here in Sham, but still far too little. Um, we, we still have a big share of the dialogue actually focusing on greening the fossil value streams uh, when we know that we need to go out of fossil. We have a lot of focus on green electrons and hydrogen, which is important, but also where we have, I think, pretty clear pathways. We just need the finance to get flowing. But the rest of the future economy that can be circular or regenerative is a bio-based economy. Um, and that discussion is still fragmented, so I think it's, it's really timely that uh, we focus more on it. Public, private sector, civil society and communities actually all need to work, work very closely together to achieve this bioeconomy. Because the bioeconomy, more than I think anything else around climate action, stands in the middle of, on the one hand, a lot of synergies that we talk about and that we've heard about today, but actually, uh, if we want to uh, really solve it, we have to realize also that there is a lot of trade-offs. If we look at the forest, our own forest, forest around the world, our forest is mainly boar forest in the north, but still the forest is both home to biodiversity, it's home to communities, it's a carbon sink and a carbon stock, and it provides some of the most valuable feedstock for producing the output that we need to have a global population that's probably reaching somewhere between 10 and 11 billion people flourish. And in there, there are trade-offs. We need more space for nature. At the same time, we probably need more output from nature as well into the economy. Or if not, we, def we need a, an incredible leapfrogging in material efficiency that goes for the forestry and material sector and that goes for the agricultural sector uh, as well. On our side, from the private sector, as Dorenzo, we have set ourselves a vision of becoming 100% regenerative with our products. And that means um, that we want to leave more than we take. We want to have a net balance in the way we operate and produce services uh, and products in the future that are net carbon positive, net biodiversity and nature positive and fully circular. The way uh, to that is, is obviously, again, difficult and full of trade-offs. And it, it is essential that we have the contribution for policymakers. The normal, the, the normal request from business is, is always to policymakers to make a level playing field. That could be nice, but I also think it's an unrealistic request. <coughs> the level playing field will not be there. So uh, we, we see geo uh, geopolitical fragmentation, um, and, and, and there is always an uneven playing field. And actually, when companies are innovating, and this is a question of innovation, it's always done in uneven playing field anyway. So I think we should leave that excuse aside what can we have from the, uh, from the public, se public sector? First of all, that the public sector does its regulation in a way that it maximizes the ability of leveraging the markets to make the change happen. On carbon, we already have a, a, a fungible currency. We need one on biodiversity as well, so that we can get money flowing from the market and get the right incentive structures 
into how the value chains are working. Policy makers have a, a, a lot to do there to both enable standardization of the account, the metrics, uh, and, and the data. And, and we are looking towards Montreal uh, and the biodiversity COP in a couple of weeks where it's essential that we get metrics that can be translated into something that we can use to leverage the markets. And another uh, point from the public sector that I would like to focus on is the public sector as a procurer. It's one of the biggest muscles globally into the markets. So the public sector can lead the way that buyers in the market are responding to these challenges by using its public procurement muscle also ahead of where the commercial uh, players are in the market. And finally, I think the public sector can be a partner in a discussion that we still need to focus more on. It's a discussion about how do we get visibility and a line of sight understanding in what are the right solutions that we have to invest in. In terms of reporting and verification, I think the global community spent almost 98% of all its effort in documenting the negative impact in the current value chains. We obviously have to continue to do that. That's the transparency that the world needs and that, that is fair. But we also need to have methodologies that can give visibility to the right solutions that can enable system transformation. Some call it handprint, some call it, for example, on carbon avoided emissions, it could be avoided degradation. There are many words for it, but no consolidated methodology. I think policymakers can also help instigate these methodologies. If we don't get visibility to that, we don't know. If we're putting the right investments in, there's a lot of things we can investment we can invest in that reduces emissions or reduces degradation, but which investments are actually enabling, enabling a system transformation we don't have visibility on. And I think those are the three points I will ask for policymakers. The first one I'm not asking, I'm not asking for a level playing field, we won't get that, and we should be brave enough to innovate anyway as companies, but I would like to ask policymakers to use their proper procurement muscle and be a partner in identifying not only reporting uh, criteria on negative impact, but also reporting on uh, uh, the positive and system changing uh, solutions that we can invest in as a global community. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for sharing these interesting points with us. I fully agree that it is absolutely important to set the right regulations to create the uh, the new market which is based on, on rules, on transparency, which is also supported by the right uh, research-based solutions and, and regulations. And it is absolutely important that the role of the, pr of the public sector, of the government, is to, to send the signals that would incentivize uh, more um, action on the side of the private sector. So now, our last but not least speaker uh, is Mr. Michael Bradkamp. He is a co-finder and general partner at the European Circular Bioeconomy Fund. I'm just checking if he's here. Hello, good morning. Michael, I see you are online with us. Thanks for joining. So my question to you is, could you please present your insights on how venture capital and institutional investors could support the transformation from fossil uh, fuel based to circular by economy? Please. Yeah, thank you, Inka. Thank you for having me. Um, yeah, it's a pleasure. From our point of view, the venture capital industry and of course, all the institutional investors are crucial uh, drivers for the transformation from a fossil based to a linear uh, bio based uh, circular economy, uh, to circular bio economy. And the main reason is that the, the business models um, and innovation for speeding up the transformation must be new. So we are looking for innovation and we want to have venture capital people really betting on these kind of opportunities, connecting with this new innovation. Venture capital is focusing on disrupting a value chain, really changing a business, because then they can really create companies that can grow and they can benefit from this. And that is what we need in the, in the bioeconomy as well. We need to have the power of entrepreneurs bringing innovation ahead. 
and they are actually speed, uh, accelerated and catalyzed by venture capitalists and uh, institutional investors. Um, so that is very crucial and important um, for the uh, development. If you look to this in detail, you can, you, or you look to the past, you can see the development in the digitalization sector. It was driven a lot by startups and venture capital companies. I think we should uh, copy this a bit for the bioeconomy. Thank you so much. That was um, a very brief intervention and, and to the point. Uh, so now we have heard from all our speakers. Uh, we have heard the, uh, the information about the uh, practical examples at the level of the communities, at the level of the um, urban settlements. We also heard from the policy makers. We heard from the private sector. We heard from the uh, uh, research um, communities. So. It was really interesting to see that there's a lot of hope in everyone's intervention, and there's a lot of practical uh, results that are absolutely important and that should be scaled up. And um, this whole conversation just proved one more time that agriculture can put on the table a lot of solutions that are absolutely important, meaningful, and that can contribute significantly to changing the global emission trajectory. But before we finish this uh, conversation, I would like to invite all our speakers to share with us very briefly uh, one uh, positive message, forward-looking message that would summarize the potential of the bioeconomy. Michael, I have you uh, on screen at the moment, so I would like to start with you. Please share with us one positive message. I, uh, I think the most important what you see is that we have great entrepreneurs entering the space and bringing in uh, innovation, which can really make a difference. And we have great opportunities uh, for this. So if the policymakers bring in the right framework, we can do business and uh, speed up the transformation significantly. So that's really a good positive signal. And we think we are entering a new chapter in the bioeconomy uh, and we need to involve more entrepreneurship and startups in uh, for speeding up um, the uh, transformation. Thank you so much. I would like to hear from Julius now. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I think um, for, for me, uh, shining a focused spotlight uh, on, on this, you know, holistic, uh, holistic, uh, systemic, cross-sectoral bioeconomy and, uh, you know, advancing it in in um, uh, in its integration in international climate policy and action, like you know we are doing right now uh, at COP27, uh, for me this will strengthen our global and regional co cooperation efforts, particularly in the areas of um, bioeconomy research, uh, bioeconomy policies and strategies. Uh, and also innovation and investment. And, and I'm very happy to, to meet you, Michael. I, I'd really want to have a deeper conversation with you on this, you know, how we can promote this type of investment opportunities, uh, particularly between Europe and Africa uh, in the area of bioeconomy. So integrating our bioeconomy in this uh, international climate policy and action would really facilitate uh, this cooperation between our regions. Excellent. Thank you. Tassila, what is your positive message? Financing, financing, financing. From the ground where I work, the farmers are very eager to lend their men and women and youths are willing to take up any technology that we bring to them. But if we cannot give them the opportunity for investment in the gaps that exist, like the blending of fertilizers that I mentioned, the crop processing access to market that I shared, then there's nothing we are doing. They all come in masses, they want to participate, but if we cannot give them through this financing process, 
the opportunity to get value out of where their sweat and blood is going into every day to grow these things and to process these things, then there's nothing that we are achieving. In the longer term sustainability of climate change issues, these are the masses we need to have on board so that they can also both help us to mitigate for climate change, but also have an economic um, improvement at household level. Thank you. Excellent. And Adrian, please share with us your positive message as well. Yeah, thank you very much. As Professor von Braun said, I mean, there are now uh, bioeconomy strategies all over the world in so many countries. And if, if I look at Europe, there are also many regions. So it's not only the countries, it's also the regions that are developing bioeconomy strategies. And so I think the, the awareness and, and the need for holistic and systemic thinking is really spreading spreading around. And that is, that is very positive and important. At the same time, we see so many innovations coming up in, from all fields. I mean, from nature-based solutions to, to biotech, I think this is really, really promising. So we have now by economy an understanding of the systemic aspects, but also of its potential. As a niche, it's very, very strong. I mean, already in Europe, it's a very strong sector. I think the, the point now that we are bringing it from this niche existence to being the default, um, there's still work to be done to make it happen. But I think we are in a very, very good start position. And I, I hope we will have a, a quick start, a quick continuation. Thank you. Thank you so much. And John, what is your positive message? Okay, yeah, I'll, I'll pick the rapidly increasing focus on natural climate solution, actually, um, both as a financing me mechanism responding to, to my fellow panelists before, but also uh, because we have seen here in Sham that the focus on natural climate solutions and with nature as part of that actually brings together in sessions here people working on the ground, for example, with mangrove restorations or other projects, intercropping, agriculture, agroforestry, together with large corporations, together with international finance sector, together with North and South ministers. So the natural climate solution has it's, a, it's an intervention of a nature that actually brings people from the ground to the high level and finance policy and corporate together in one dialogue. And we've seen that many places. And I think that brings great hope. Excellent. Thank you so much. And I would like to conclude our fascinating discussion. I also would like to thank all the participants and also the, the speakers for joining us today. It was a very interesting conversation and we look forward to having more sessions like this one on the effects and the opportunities and the challenges and the hope for the bioeconomy. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you. Thank bye you. bye. bye.